Okay, Tammy, you want to give me a check? One, two, three, four, five. Awesome. Thank you so much. Have a good show.
Don't worry about yourself. A quorum being present, uh, the Subcommittee on Higher Education and Workforce Development will come to order. I will first yield to Chairman Fox for one minute for an opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Ch Guthrie. I thank all of you for being here. This hearing is incredibly important for us as we look to see if the improvements to our workforce development system that we intended with WIOA are actually coming to pass. We're all here because we want to help Americans access all the resources they need to get back to work. This morning, President Trump will sign an executive order aimed at promoting apprenticeships and skill-focused education. I love that term, and I think it's, uh, it is a great way to uh, refer to what we're doing. And it is the kind of focus that students and workers have needed from the White House for a long time. In just a few minutes, I'm going to excuse myself so I can go tell President Trump on behalf of this entire committee that we welcome his interest in his efforts to build a better workforce. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for yielding. I very much look forward to reviewing the findings of the hearings, and I yield back. Thank you, Chairman, Chairman Fox, I appreciate that. Uh, now I yield to uh, Mr. Scott, the Ranking Member Scott for one minute. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you and Ranking Member Davis for convening today's hearing. I think the conversation around changes that we owe are made in our nation's workforce development system and in, um, in preparing Americans for high school jobs is a critical one. Today, um, uh, Chairman, Chairwoman Fox and I will um, be witnessing the president. We expect him to sign the executive order on apprenticeships. We know that registered apprenticeship programs are proven on-the-job training models. They allow workers to earn while they learn, but when we send federal dollars to promote and expand new, new apprenticeships, we need to have accountability, and that's why I'm hoping that uh, we will not change the registration process. Federal dollars for apprenticeship programs now go to registered apprenticeship programs. You know what you get. When you graduate, they're transferable. Other employers know what you can do and what you can't do. Uh, if it's unregistered, it's going to be difficult to get some kind of accountability. Department of Labor and 25 state apprenticeship agencies establish a baseline for labor standards in the registered program. So I hope today's announcement will not undercut the proven model. And while I cannot uh, stay to hear the witnesses' testimony, I hope that part of this conversation they can tell about registered apprenticeship programs and how important they are and how they are aligned with WIOA. And I hope we can also discuss the dangers of allowing federal funding to go to unregistered uh, programs. Uh, but I think we can, hopefully we can work this, uh, work this out because there is a strong consensus that apprenticeship programs are extremely valuable to young people uh, trying to get uh, good high-skilled jobs. So Mr. Chair, thank you very much and I uh, look forward to working with you. Thank you, thank you for your comments. I now recognize myself for opening comments and welcome everyone to today's uh, subcommittee hearing. I'd like to thank our panel of witnesses and my colleagues for joining today's important discussion on the implementation of Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, WIOA. It has been almost three years since the Bipartisan Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act was signed into law, and now it is time for Congress to explore whether or not the included reforms are being turned into action. Prior to the passage of WIOA, the federal government had over 47 separate but overlapping employment education programs across nine different federal agencies. To make matters worse, most of the programs targeted similar population and provided similar services. Additionally, the report also found that only five of the programs have been evaluated for effectiveness and their success rate in helping unemployed and underemployed workers find employment. These programs were textbook cases of how the federal government can create a a web of well-intentioned programs that are not serving the needs of the very Americans for whom the services are designed. As a result, congressional action was needed to fix these programs so American workers could, su could succeed in a recovery economy. The bipartisan passage of WIOA streamlined the confusing maze of workforce development programs. 
decreased administrative overhead, required better coordination for adult, unemployed, and youth programs, and increased accountability for the use of taxpayer funds. I'm proud to say that so many members of this committee, including Chairwoman Fox, played an instrumental role in creating the final version of WIOA that was signed into law. Congress answered the call for workforce education and development reforms, but has faced an uphill climb in getting these reforms implemented on the state and local level. Despite the overwhelming support for the passage of WIOA, it faced significant implementation delays during the previous administration. For example, the Department of Labor missed key deadlines when issuing guidance to state and local leaders. According to Government Accountability Office, these delays made it difficult to carry out many of WIOA's strategic opportunity priorities. While we have a new administration, the need for congressional oversight is still essential to ensure a, a timely and proper, proper implementation of WIOA. Our conversation today cannot be timelier as President Trump announces new measures to strengthen our nation's workforce, education, and development programs. While the President's executive actions are encouraging, the implementation of WIOA and congressional action to reauthorize federal support for career and technical education can provide a lasting improvement to how our citizens find success through workforce development education. Our witnesses before us are some of the best stories of WIOA's success, and I look forward to hearing their stories throughout today's hearing. Their testimony will only further emphasize the need for federal entities to implement the reforms put forth in WIOA as Congress intended. Congress has provided the necessary statutory reforms to our workforce education and development programs. And now, more than ever, it is important we deliver on implementation, ensuring that American workers are being driven, given the skills they need to thrive in the 21st century economy. I will now yield my, to my distinguished colleague and this subcommittee's ranking member, Susan Davis, for her opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Guthrie. I appreciate your convening this important hearing and want to thank all of our witnesses for being here. I also want to just at, at the outset to express um, my prayers and my concerns for the victims and their families, and we wish them a full recovery from the events of yesterday. Today's hearing is focused on the implementation of the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, what we know as WIOA. This landmark bipartisan bill that the chairman just spoke of, whose primary author is the distinguished chairwoman of our committee, Dr. Fox, was signed by President Obama nearly three years ago. I was certainly proud to be among the 400 House members who supported WIOA, and I know for those members of this committee who uh, were here, uh, I, uh, I know that they are proud of that as well, and proud because it sought to help workers, to benefit businesses, revitalize our economy, and strengthen the middle class. Specifically, we always sought to ensure working people of all ages and all abilities could get the training and the skills they need to obtain well-paying jobs. It also sought to ensure employers who could, that they could hire a skilled workforce so our country can compete in the global economy. In my district, the workforce system has become an incubator for developing innovative training programs for young people. Tech sector industry leaders, the workforce system, and educators are coming together to develop programs where young people emerge with life-enhancing productive skills sought in the marketplace. WIOA encourages and even demands that these groups come together to meet the needs of an ever-changing economy. The reality is that as budgets are cut, the first programs to go are the newest and the most forward-thinking. The innovation that WIOA is fostering could be halted, preventing the expansion of these partnerships. So, Mr. Chairman, fulfilling an innovative vision of our workforce becomes even more challenging. <clears throat> challenging when you consider the cuts put forth in the President's proposed budget. These cuts would undermine the progress and advancements our workforce system has made in the past few years. As you'll see on the screen, and we're going to put up some numbers. Well. We always worry about tech at the time that you need it, right? <laughs> well, we're, hopefully that will get up there. The, um, the president proposed funding cuts for the youth, for the adult training, dislocated workers, and adult education formula. Funds for each of our home states by about 40% cuts 
by about 40% from current funding levels for all of those programs. In all, the President's budget proposed a staggering $1 billion in cuts to these programs. And now that that is on the screen, what it indicates um, for many uh, of the members, their home state, not their home district, but for their home state, the cuts in, in the four different programs. More importantly, we have not yet had a full year of what we owe a implementation data to analyze. It's unthinkable to consider cutting critical programs without giving them a chance to become established and successful in our communities. Modernizing our nation's workforce system is critical. Researchers estimate that at our nation's current rates of training and educating the United States, of training and educating, the United States will face a shortage of 5 million skilled educator workers by 2020. And by 2020, 65% of all jobs will require some form of post-secondary degree or credential. So in this hearing, I hope we can take a close look at how our workforce systems have improved since WIOA. But also, I hope to hear how we can build upon these successes and surmount any challenges. Because together we must ensure that WIOA fulfills its goals of improving the quality of job training programs and aligning training to real world labor market needs. In particular, we must be sure to empower people with disabilities, disconnected youth, and dislocated workers who have faced barriers to ending our workforce systems for far too long, for entering our workforce systems. In the weeks and the months ahead, I'm hopeful that Congress will reject the President's proposed cuts to job training programs and make the right investments in our nation's workforce development system. But we shouldn't stop there. We should be working together on a bipartisan basis, just like we did with WIOA, to help workers get ahead, to make college more affordable and accessible, and restore balance to the economy so all Americans can provide a better future for their families. Thank you very much, Chairman Guthrie, for convening today's hearing, and all the witnesses, again, for taking time out to be with us today. Thank you. Thank you. I thank the ranking member for yielding back in her comments. Uh, pursuant to Committee Rule 7C, all members will be permitted to submit written statements to be included in the permanent record. And without objection, the hearing record will remain open for 14 days to allow such statements and other extraneous material referenced during the hearing to be submitted for the official hearing record. Today, I welcome uh, Mr. Wilson to the subcommittee and recognize him to introduce our first witness. Thank you, Chairman uh, Guthrie, for inviting me to be here today. Uh, Chairman Brett Guthrie, Ranking Member Susan Davis, members of the subcommittee, I'm grateful for the opportunity to introduce fellow South Carolinian Michelle Pazinski. I appreciate also being here with Chairman Virginia Fox, who is working so closely with President Donald Trump to help American families with fulfilling lives. Ms. Brzezinski serves as the Deputy Assistant Director for Workforce and Economic Development at the South Carolina Department of Employment and Workforce. In her role, she advances a business-inspired workforce system, one that develops strategic partnerships that enhances the workforce system's ability to produce a workforce pipeline for jobs. I am grateful that she is before the subcommittee to testify today. Through the efforts of Ms. Brzezinski and other members of the South Carolina Department of Employment and Workforce, South Carolina has seen a remarkable success in implementing the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. Of special note is their use of innovative strategies like career and technical education, program partnerships, apprenticeships, technical colleges to develop talent pipelines, and addressing infrastructure challenges to ensure that people find meaningful jobs as we have achieved, and she has, at uh, Boeing, at MTU, at BMW, we were just discussing all these, uh, Michelin Tire Corporation, Bridgestone Tire Corporation, and now soon uh, Volvo to be located in South Carolina. Their success is clear and tangible. South Carolina's unemployment rate is at a 16-year low, and more and more businesses from around the country are realizing that our talented workforce and pro-business climate make our state a great place to create or locate a business with meaningful jobs. I look forward to hearing Ms. Pazinski outline how South Carolina's Department of Employment and Workforce has implemented the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act and hope her perspective can provide examples and best practices other states can use when looking to maximize their implementation of the act and to help more of their citizens find jobs. 
Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to introduce Ms. Brzezinski. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Wilson, and I will continue this morning's introductions. Mr. Heath Berlin is an Information Insurance Manager at the Naval Healthcare Clinic Annapolis, beat Navy, I have to say that. <laughs> when I say Annapolis, I'm just in me. Mr. Ron Painter is the President and CEO of the National Association of Workforce Boards. And Mr. Lewis Dubin is the Chairman of the Governor's Workforce Development Board for the State of Maryland. I will now ask the witnesses to raise their right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record reflect the witnesses answered in the infer affirmative. Before I recognize you to provide your testimony, let me briefly explain our lighting system. You will each have five minutes to present your testimony. When you begin, the light in front of you will turn green. When one minute is left, the light will turn yellow. When your time has expired, the light will turn red. When the light turns red, I will ask you that you wrap up your remarks as best as you're able. Members will have five minutes each after your testimony to ask questions. Uh, first, I will recognize for five minutes for opening testimony, Ms. Pazinski. Thank you, Representative Fox, Representative Scott, Representative Wilson, Chairman Guthrie, Ranking Member Representative Davis, and the members of the subcommittee. It's an honor and privilege to be here today to talk about the progress we have made because of the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. We are putting South Carolinians to work. South Carolina's economy is strong and growing as businesses continue to relocate and expand in our state. We have a record number of people working and an unemployment rate at a 16-year low. Congress's efforts to pass the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act has provided South Carolina the ability to tackle workforce development through innovative ways to better engage businesses and educate and empower our workforce. Our transformational journey began with collaboration. Under WIOA, the State Workforce Development Board is considered to be the state's architect and ambassador for workforce development. With majority representation by business leaders from the state's high growth industries, South Carolina's board convened the workforce partners and executed a memorandum of understanding. This contract was the platform for stakeholders to move forward in unison towards retooling the workforce system and educating our existing and emerging workforce. WIOA fueled South Carolina's ability to deploy initiatives that address business and industry's concerns of a fractured workforce system. The South Carolina Talent Pipeline Initiative, also known as Sector Strategies, was the incubator for regional industry-focused methods to build a skilled workforce that identify and address skill needs across key industries rather than focusing on transactional workforce needs of individual businesses. A critical component that was identified in analysis of our workforce system was the lack of public transit for employment and education. In an effort to empower region strategies to build their workforce, the State Workforce Development Board is investing state-level WIOA funds into communities that have designed innovative public transit models. WIOA champions the prioritization of services for those who face significant barriers to employment. South Carolina has experienced great success in educating and employing ex-offenders into high growth industries. Historically, ex-offenders were released into the same environment from which they came, lacking the education and skills needed to succeed outside of prison. Using Title III money, South Carolina piloted a job center behind the wire, deploying a case manager and laptops on site to provide the same services and information provided to job seekers in a one-stop center. The, of the 516 people who have completed the program and have since been released, 75% are earning wages. Seeing the outcomes from this pilot, the State Workforce Development Board invested state-level WIOA funds to expand employment services into additional correctional facilities. WIOA has also reinforced our emphasis on apprenticeships as the premier tool for businesses to recruit and retain workers. 
South Carolina provides businesses with a $1,000 tax credit per apprentice for up to four years. With 893 active apprentice programs in South Carolina, the State Board sought to braid apprenticeships with services provided to priority populations and awarded state-level WIOA funds into competitive grants. WIOA emphasizes that relationships between the public and private sectors is crucial in the workforce system's ability to provide businesses with workforce solutions. Several members of our State Workforce Development Board also serve as representatives on the State Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors, and as a result, many of our workforce initiatives align with the State Chamber's 2025 education goals. In conclusion, WIOA has significantly expanded South Carolina's ability to strategically align resources, programs, and policies to build a skilled workforce and more effectively serve businesses. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I now recognize Mr. Berlin for five minutes for his testimony. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the subcommittee. Um, <clears throat> So I'm, I'm here as a uh, uh, successful candidate of uh, the uh, WIOA Act, WIOA, and uh, the program in Maryland's called the Maryland Tech Connection. So I'll just give you a little bit of how I came to be in contact with workforce development and... Would you pull your mic up a little closer to me? Oh, that would be easier to hear. Thank you. <clears throat> so in... Uh, on December 31st, uh, 2015, New Year's Eve, the company I worked for, Resilience Technology Corporation, was acquired uh, by another company, Integrata Security. Um, and after about a month, uh, Integrata laid all the employees off. Some of us were called back a few weeks later, uh, but by May of 2016, everybody was laid off. So I uh, started looking for jobs. Um, lots of interviews, uh, lots of job fairs, things like that, without getting any traction. In July, I went to the uh, uh, Anne Arundel Workforce Development Center in Arnold, Maryland, and registered for one of the WIOA workshops. Um, the next available one was in August, as they were filling up. Um, so after the workshop, I met with um, a woman named Carla Wynn, who uh, accepted me into the program. I qualified because I was receiving unemployment benefits. Um, and together with her, we sort of mapped out a strategy of what I needed to uh, get reemployed and what the obstacles I was finding um, to employment. Um, and some of those were uh, certifications, the uh, Network Plus, Security Plus, and Certified Ethical Hacker certification. Um, which I had trained for previously, but never had taken the exams because you know previous employers had said they would pay for it, and you know by the time by the time I really needed them, there was nobody there to pay for it, particularly me. Um, so they were able to provide funding for um, uh, the certified ethical hacker uh, education course and exam, and also vouchers for the CompTIA Security Plus and Network Plus exams. So I completed those and continued searching for a job. However, I wasn't successful. I had lots of support from the program. Uh, there was a career coach, Carl Kuczynski, who was very helpful in helping me focus my resume, uh, practicing interviews before going to the actual interviews. Um, and even though, you know, every day I would spend all day on the computer applying for jobs, phone interviews, video conference interviews, face-to-face -face interviews, I just wasn't getting anywhere. So by November, I hit the six-month mark, unemployment ran out, and I was still employed, at, at which time uh, Carl uh, introduced me to Alfredo Quiero, Quiroga, we call him Q, um, who uh, delivered, I guess he was the instructor and the guy that gives, enrolls people in Maryland Tech Connection, which uh, the program itself uh, focuses on people who have been long-term unemployed, uh, which they define as greater than six months. Um, so I met with Q at an informational uh, uh, seminar that he held at the Glen Burnie Workforce Development Center. 
um, and made an appointment for testing. You report to the, uh, Anne Arundel, uh, the Laurel Anne Arundel Workforce Development Center for aptitude testing, uh, sort of to see what maybe your passion is. Maybe, you know, the, the program itself sort of has two tracks it, it seems to focus on with industry partners, one being uh, IT and IT security, the other being uh, biomedical science and technology. So the aptitude tests sort of help you define what you know, what you're good at, and what your passion is, as well as maybe what soft skills you have or need. Uh, and after taking these tests, you, um, you are assigned to the program. Luck of the draw, anyhow. Long story short, uh, while in the program, I discovered the Earn and Learn program. While I had been looking for a job, I interviewed with this company called Phalanx, who wanted to hire me, but they were startups, so they didn't have money. So when I reached back out to them after being in the program for two days and explained the Earn and Learn program, they immediately got on board and asked for more information and said if we could work it out, if there would be the funding to bring me on board with some sort of subsidy while I was getting up to speed, uh, they would be glad to hire me right away. And so within a month of entering into the program, I was employed full-time with Phalanx Security. Thank you for your testimony. Appreciate it. That's that's good. Enjoyed hearing your testimony, Mr. Payne. You're recognized for five minutes for your testimony. Chairman Guthrie, Ranking Member Davis, and Subcommittee members, I thank you for the opportunity to testify before the subcommittee today regarding WIOA, which this committee crafted and Congress overwhelmingly approved in 2014. My name is Ron Painter, and I'm the President and CEO of the National Association of Workforce Boards, which represents the nation's 550 workforce boards and the over 15,000 volunteers who serve on that board, those boards, a majority of whom are from the private sector. Boards coordinate, help launch, and oversee workforce development strategies for their cities, regions, and states, partnering with local elected officials, education, economic development, our entities in, in WIOA, Adult Literacy, Wagner Pizer, Volk Rehab, and a large network of stakeholders in their region. There is an astonishing amount of churn in America's labor market. The most recent year saw over 60, 60 million separations from jobs and over 62 million hires. State and local workforce boards strive to understand the changes in labor markets that are evidenced in this churn and to align the workforce development system accordingly so that people get to work quickly with the skills that are in demand. Workforce development boards leverage state and local general revenue funds, private philanthropic funding, and fee-for-service revenue. But the federal funds are key to making all of this happen. We urge the 115th Congress to renew its commitment to a world-class skilled workforce through adequate funding of education at all levels in the workforce development system by maintaining the funding levels for for WIOA in, 20, in, in FY18. WIOA brought numerous changes to the workforce development system, including requiring the Departments of Labor and Education to implement a common performance accountability system across the six core programs, which will provide a more consistent outcome data on which to base evaluations. While the most extensive full evaluation of, of workforce is still underway, there are initial results from this gold standard evaluation. In the preliminary findings, we can see that the availability of intensive services, people-to-people -people work that Heath experienced, increased earnings and employment for program participants. Evidence is also demonstrating that the most effective type of skill development is one linked directly to specific work and skills and demands within a region. Work-based training models, which are the core of WIOA, including registered apprenticeships and industry-specific training, are very impactful and alone call for increased funding to WIOA. Let me mention quickly three examples. IT coding program in Eastern Kentucky, an initiative of the Eastern Kentucky Concentrated Employment Program called Teleworks USA, identifies and develops legitimate remote work opportunities and helps people prepare for and land these jobs in numerous counties across the state. This effort, though, has thus far been estimated to have an economic impact of more than 13.1 million in new wages to Eastern Kentuckians by network employees inside and outside the state. In Connecticut, Electric Boat, which builds nuclear submarines for the U.S. Navy and its supply network in the region, have benefited from an initiative led by the Eastern Con Connecticut Workforce Board 
called the Eastern Connecticut Manufacturing Pipeline Initiative. Electric Boat's work is expected to, to yield over 500 additional skilled workers, and employers find that the initiative's trainees are better prepared for success. Likewise, the boards in Newport News, Virginia, working with Huntington Ingalls on, on the shipyard. In Pittsburgh, a large urban health care provider struggled to hire and retain environmental service workers. These workers have a direct correlation to infection control, readmission, and customer satisfaction. Partners for Work, the Workforce Board in Pittsburgh, partnered with the Energy Innovation Center, itself a consortium of education and business, to build a mock hospital unit and design curriculum with a clear pathway to work. Thus far, 100% of the participants have been placed with starting wages of $12.50. These examples demonstrate that workforce boards are core to their communities by convening industry sectors to ascertain skill needs, designing solutions with community college and others, funding some of those solutions, and successfully recruiting and placing participants. We assure you that advances in better data gathering and analytics, guided by the private sector's twin focus of effectiveness and continuous improvement, further offer promise for an even more effective delivery system. And again, we urge Congress to reject the proposed cuts. I thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to answering questions. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Dubin. You're now uh, uh, recognized for five minutes for your testimony. Thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you, Chairman three and members of the committee for inviting me to testify today. It's actually quite thrilling to be here today. I'm Louis Dubin, Chairman of the Maryland Governor's Workforce Development Board, our state board, and managing partner of Red Brick LMD, a diversified real estate investment management and development firm. The state board's made up of 53 members representing business, workforce, education, union, and partner state agencies. As required by Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, WIOA, our state board has a business majority, and all members of the board are appointed by the governor. The goal of the state board is to build partnerships and relationships that align the needs of business and job seekers through a purposeful approach with key stakeholders to support workforce and economic growth in the state of Maryland. Maryland is open for business, and this is part of that theme. Inclusion, diversity, and determination are really the cornerstones of our success. We've created five business-led task force groups based on industry sectors. This is one of our real keys to, I think, our secret sauce. Those uh, sectors include cybersecurity, IT, healthcare life sciences, manufacturing skilled trades, uh, changing demographics, and marketing branding. We created an ambassador program where each of the board members had a responsibility to reach out to colleagues in their respective areas of expertise and invite them to join the conversation as part of the task force. We currently have over 100 workforce stakeholders, these are all volunteers, that meet to advise the governor and make recommendations on workforce development programs and strategies targeted to these specific in-demand industries and populations in the state. It's narrow, it's focused. State Board built a framework to allow for collaboration and conversation among all workforce stakeholders centered around an anchor organization that has displayed best practices in a specific industry sector. For example, we had our cybersecurity task force hosted by the National Security Agency, which was attended by over 20 stakeholders on our cybersecurity task force. NSA described their recruitment process and communication with educational institutions, assessment procedures, and career training programs. Uh, this type of purposeful engagement allows both government and private sector to collaborate with the state and local workforce system community college and university leaders to develop relevant curriculums and transfer best practices so they can become part of the workforce ecosystem. Inclusion, diversity, determination. These task force connections have led to employers building relationships and individual, with individual school district leaders. Together they provide K-12 school professionals, professional development to teachers, counselors, principals, and parents. Now they can guide students and make them aware of potential opportunities to participate in robotics competitions, cyber competitions, and exercises that can lead to a career in cybersecurity and IT. One of our state's leading nonprofits, Living Classrooms, run two, runs two charter schools and after school programs, re recently won the Divisional Robotics Championship with a team of inner city at risk youth and competed and placed in an international robotics competition recently out of 1,300 teams. Uh, internationally, uh, we got 51, 51st. 
big successes. Living Classrooms is an example of how we can look at all of our state's resources, public and private, community and faith-based, to provide our students with the, excuse me, the skills they need to succeed in the workforce. Living Classrooms is doing wonders in Baltimore and DC, but there are also terrific examples in rural communities. Congressman Barletta, the Shine After School program in your district is an example of a rural after school partnership that is preparing our students for the future. Partnering with Carbon Career and Technical Institute at Lehigh Carbon Community College, Shine provides an innovative educational model by teaming technical experts with academic teachers and through hands-on career projects connects students to math science with a real world application. Inclusion, diversity, determination. In April, Governor Hogan announced apprenticeship awards to local community partners through the Apprenticeship Innovation Fund, which was developed with the U.S. Department of Labor with a $2 million grant to advance apprenticeships in Maryland. There are many possibilities for creating opportunities to assist in the development of apprenticeship programs, not only in traditional universities, such, traditional industries such as construction and other skilled trades, but also by expanding into the non-traditional industries such as information technology, healthcare, and cybersecurity. We have apprenticeship services, TransEd, they've received over two awards to provide pre-apprenticeship pre services to over 200 apprentices in the cyber and IT space. They'll provide outreach services to new employers, recruit and attract new apprentices through engagement with local schools, and receive job seekers with interview and technical skills, inclusion, diversity, determination. We also have a benchmarking program, which is a little too long for my five minutes today, that we've outlined in our written, written testimony, that it, Appreciate you all reading as well, but thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to give our comments. Thank you. I thank all the witness, witnesses for their testimony. We'll now move to member questions, and I'll recognize myself for five minutes for the purpose of asking questions. And so, Mr. Dubin, in your experience, you just finished your testimony. What's the most important element to making a, your, the success of your state workforce board? What's the secret to your secret sauce, I guess, is there? I mean, I think a lot of it is inclusion and people that are being included in the conversation and process having a stake, whether it's an educator, whether it's a business, uh, whether it's a, a, a job seeker. Um, we have representation of really all different kinds of people that are in that workforce ecosystem <laughs> on the task forces, and there's a lot of energy behind it. So, and we require you in person, you know, attending a certain number of meetings if you're gonna be on the board and it's somewhat disciplined. Um, I think that's part of it, is just the citizens uh, of our state that, that are part of, that, are, that have a stake in the workforce system, which most people do, um, getting involved and, and really making this ambassadorship program uh, an important cornerstone to build upon and telling our board members, we have over 50 board members, that this is one of the expectations we have of you of recruiting people. You know, it's those, that web, it's those connections that end up ultimately getting people trained and ultimately uh, purposeful and meaningful employment. Thank you, I appreciate the answer to that. Mr. Berlin, I was interested to, to learn that your employment program focused on job seekers of similar age. After receiving the services, did this focus seem to make sense? And of the services you were provided that uniquely benefit job seekers your age, are there any you would recommend other than workforce development agents that other workforce development agencies should consider? Um, other other age groups? Or? So you, you were an age particular workforce program, similar age workforce program. All, you thought that of, was beneficial to be all of similar the, age? Well, all of, all of the participants in the class that I was in were of a similar age. Right. Was that, do you thought that was helpful or do you thought it should have been just diverse along the ages or was it something you were sharing similar experiences, I guess? Uh, um, I guess. Uh, you, well, I think it was helpful because we all had sort of common life experiences, common purposes, a common experience in looking for jobs. Um, I mean, it was a diverse group, you know, ethnically. Um, you know, I think probably the youngest people were in their uh, mid, maybe early 30s, but in, in general, everyone was pretty close in age to me. I'm yeah, I guess my question, I, and you're answering it, is, is that having people in the similar similar situation, I mean diverse and other, I'm talking just age, it, it's helpful because you're having the same experiences instead of having somebody looking for their first job or somebody looking for a, a change in career. So I appreciate your answer in that, thank you. Yeah. Um, so Ms. Bozinski, uh, in enacting the Workforce Innovation Pro Opportunity Act, Congress envisioned a business-led workforce development system that encourages increased efficiency, program innovation, and competition. 
What steps has South Carolina taken to increase competition and provide expanded program options to state businesses? We've worked very closely with our State Chamber of Commerce, who is the voice of business and industry, as well as other trade associations. And they've informed us that it's the accelerated training, the credentials and the certificates that are essential to fill the jobs today to address that skill mismatch and soft skills. And the soft skill area in our state, um, developing a correct curriculum designed by the soft skill needs of our business and industry and deploying that statewide. Uh, those are areas in which we've highlighted on, coupled with apprenticeships, making sure that not only that we can put in place apprenticeships for adults and youth, but incentivizing it for businesses. That $1,000 tax credit is essential. Well, thank you, and it's all important what you're doing. Every business person that I know is saying we need access to a better skilled workforce, so we appreciate uh, what efforts you are doing. That concludes my questions, and I'll yield back and recognize uh, Ranking Member Davis, five minutes for questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I wanted to say that I, I was really impressed by everything that you had to say, and I think in many ways, with your very eloquent um, way of, of providing that experience that you've had, um, that you make the case that WIOA uh, is progressing, is making a difference. And at the same time, we know that there's not a lot of reporting that we've been able to benefit from yet because the full program has really only been there for, for a, a year. But I wonder if, you know, given that, do, do any of you believe that a 40% cut in WIOA programs, kind of across the board for all the different, the, particularly the four different programs, um, would further our country's need for high standard training? Uh, and good jobs. You really feel that that would be help, make a difference? Would it make us <clears throat> focus differently, consolidate any of those programs? No? Okay, just for the record, I wanted to, to be sure I was hearing you correctly because I, I do think you were, you were very enthusiastic. I also wanted to, um, perhaps very quickly, if, if, and if you could just give one example, what, what, um, do you believe would be the impact of changes um, if we did try to, whether it's consolidation, whether it's cutting of programs, what effect would that have? Is there one particular program that you think would really be effective? Mr. Painter, you want to start um, as, as a representative of, of the workforce boards? Uh, thank you, Congressman Davis. Um, We've, we've been asking our members, like, what, what impact do, do the cuts have? And certainly you can begin to see it quickly and rapidly when you start looking at a reduction in the number of adults that, like Heath, that are supported in, in training. You're going to look at a retrenchment in the amount of training resources that are given to any one individual to try and... It's always a dilemma. Do you serve more people with a little bit, or do you serve people deeply with, with uh, the resources that, that they may need? But I think clearly, as we, as we look at the boards, we see cuts across the board in, in the number of individuals who would be trained. I think it also starts to put a, a uh, puts deep pressure on the system because the kinds of things that we see in the early evaluation that are important are these intensive services, and that's where one individual talks to another individual, works with them on what kind of assessment, what kind of aptitudes they have, what kind of options and opportunities are available. So when you start impacting the, the training and then you start impacting the infrastructure of how people who are currently get there. Thank you. I, just, I wanted to just go down and, and see if, if others have just a, a different thought about where, where you think those cuts would go again because we're talking about newer programs, innovative programs that could be actually first on the chopping list. Spazinski, do you want to respond? I think your mic's not on. Thank you, Representative Davis. Uh, in South Carolina, we would likely serve fewer individuals and fewer businesses. However, the state of our economy will ulti ultimately determine how we will move forward with workforce development. Thank you. Mr. Berlin, where would you have been if perhaps those relationships weren't available to you to, to build on for your... Right, yeah, commenting on the funding cuts and stuff like that is a bit beyond me, but I can tell you that uh, it, it was... Uh, 
I don't know that I would be here today talking about having been successfully employed again if those programs were not available to me. And I think it'd be a shame if other people that were in my similar circumstances did not have that available. Thank you. Mr. Durbin? Uh, in fact, you spoke uh, very enthusiastically about apprenticeships. And one of the things, if I could ask you this question, uh, is that we're, we, we know that the president is announcing um, a new direction, uh, supposedly, today. And I'm wondering whether you think that um, there is a risk uh, in not having programs that are going to have a higher, high level of accountability uh, as, as we look at apprenticeship programs or, or other um, certified programs. What, what risk do you see? Well, I would hope there'd be some corresponding additional programs that I think are going to be announced, or some of that today. So I'm not privy to what those are, but I would hope there'd be some corresponding programs. I am very enthusiastic on apprenticeships and CTE. I know it's a whole nother discussion, but mm -hmm. I would hope that the dialogue includes not only apprenticeships, but uh, CTE in our schools that are pathways into very meaningful employment. In many cases, these young people, we have a, a lot of CTE success stories come to our state board. They're making a lot more than their, than their colleagues a few years before graduating from high school, and they've just started to save, and some of them have Thank bought you. their first house. So. Thank you. I know, I know my time is up, and we have to be reminded that these are federal dollars that are going into those programs so that there is an important element. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the ranking member yields back. I now recognize Mr. Mitchell for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have a, an interesting experience in that I began in workforce development in 1978. Uh, I'm dating myself. Those who have been around for I remember CETA. Uh, and I experienced CETA, JTPA, WIA, and WIOA, uh, different place on WIOA. We operated, uh, we operated those programs. And when I started out, I worked for the state of Michigan uh, in the Bureau of Employment Training. What's amazing to me is the, it's taken this long to get an evolution that, in fact, we recognize that you have two customers. You have the employer community, and you have individuals needing assistance to go to work because it's taken that long to make this evolution. Uh, it, it's really, if you think about it, quite an interesting word. It was largely government driven back at CETA and JTPA days to finally recognizing that the, we really have to serve the business community and the individuals seeking employment. The ROI is clearly improving for both taxpayers and individuals seeking assistance, and that is a wonderful thing to see. Finally, we can get a better handle on measuring that. I am concerned, however, a couple of things I want to address with questions. One is about the idea that two things have been said. Well, we've, we've gotten improvements, and with more money, we can get more improvements. I spent 35 years, or 30 years in private business, and we didn't just throw money at it to get improvements. It was improving how we deliver the system. Um, help me out. Maybe Ms. Pajinski can help me. Uh, what was the unemployment rate in South Carolina, pick 2010, 2012? What was the unemployment rate then? Roughly, pick a number. I, I would say, I, I don't have that number in front of me, but significantly higher than the current uh, 4.3, perhaps right around 8%, but I, I don't know for certain. Yeah, and in my state, it was, it was double digits. Uh, it, it was truly brutal in Michigan. And um, yet, at this point in time, some members of the committee and others uh, argue that we need to fund uh, Wyoa at the exact same level that we funded it historically with, of course, various cost of living increases or you know, adjustments, uh, but then employment rates down dramatically. Uh, your service population is, is reduced, especially among the dislocated workers. And, and I think we need to be honest about that as we talk about it in the appropriations process in Congress, that what do we need to deliver the, to meet the needs of individuals and businesses and not just, well, we spent that last year, so we need to spend it this year. That's a government mentality. That's not a realistic private sector mentality. And so as we talk forward, uh, we need to do that in, here in Congress, and I would encourage all of you to do that. Yeah, we require adjustments. The other fallacy, and, and all of you here know that, is that if there's a reduction, and I'm not here rallying for 40% reduction in workforce development funds, trust me on that, uh, that all of it's reduced from training grants, from what trains people. Uh, Mr. Painter, how much is, uh, how much is allocated for uh, the uh, Workforce Board Administration, State Administration, and the Bay Act? Administrative expenses under WIOA are limited to 10 percent. At the agency? At the, at the workforce board level, yes. And then at the state, it's how much? 
Do you know? Uh, it, would, it would be the same 10%. That's 20. And then when I worked in the state, and it's still the case now, there's also something called the indirect cost rate, which is another 5 or 7%. So pretty quickly, my point is, is that we peel off money out of this system with a whole series of levels of administrative costs, and we're assuming any reduction in grants is going to simply result in this chart. It's not true. It's not accurate. And one of the things we need to do as a system, both here in Congress, and I encourage you to do, is look at how much money, how much we're putting in admin, and what do we need to do to, in fact, focus the money as much as we can and reduce those administrative costs. That's what we did as a business. One quick question also, if I could, and maybe, Mr. German, you could help me. One of the things we've experienced in Michigan is uh, challenges with linking the workforce development programs, private sector programs, with the K-12 education system. We still haven't gotten that where it's working well so we can begin the current technical ed for, for children, young people when they're still in school so they transition out to apprenticeship or something like that. What recommendations do you have that would help with that? Well, our superintendent of schools sits on the board. Actually, about uh, most of our cabinet in the state sits on the workforce development board, and many of them come to the meetings. And the time before last, we had uh, our superintendent of schools and most of the meeting was around CTE and education um, and the awareness of that. And uh, we have many employers there. We have uh, the union and other representatives there and on the board. And uh, the board's somewhat of an educational opportunity, and we use it as that. We usually have two or three presentations each board meeting about subject matter or some of these programs people may not really know about. And just having the, sup the superintendent of schools, okay. that that's a good first step, I think. I think you're right. And one final comment, Mr. Chair, is uh, my robotics team says they can take your robotics team. <laughs> Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you. Thank you, I yield back. Thank you, yield back. Thank you, gentlemen, for yielding back. I now recognize Mr. Courtney for five minutes for questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I really appreciate um, you and the ranking member putting the spotlight on WIOA. I was at the executive office building the day the, the law was uh, signed in to law on July 22nd, 2014. It was a beautiful sight. President Obama, Vice President Biden, Chairwoman Fox, uh, bipartisan group uh, responding to an issue that I think every single member has heard loud and clear from their district. And the other thing I remember from it, there was not a single TV camera in the room. And when you tried to sort of find the press coverage, it was just buried. And, and um, you know, uh, I guess you can sort of draw a lot of conclusions from that. But uh, again, the, the um, I appreciate Mr. Painter uh, bringing up the EWIB. Uh, board in Eastern Connecticut, which is my district. Uh, again, the um, ramping up of uh, ship production, submarine production, uh, is uh, been a phenomenon that's been going on over the last three or four years. The demand for welders, electricians, machinists uh, is off the charts, along with engineers and designers. And the statistics that you um, shared in terms of what the, the Eastern Connecticut Manufacturing Pipeline Program has produced frankly, is only just a part of the story. I mean, about the four or 500 that have come through uh, these programs and have been snapped up immediately, the employment rate is 100% for people that are going through there with great jobs, with good benefits. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is that the registrants into the program is about 10 times as large. Over 3,000 people have, have uh, gone into the portal to uh, sign up. And again, we're, we're, we're moving forward in terms of uh, getting people enrolled in future classes. But two things, number one, it shows that this sort of narrative that Americans don't want to get involved with dirty manufacturing is a false narrative. I mean, the fact of the matter is, is that there really are takers out there who, if they are given the opportunity to close the skills gap, they'll do it. And, and the second, uh, obviously, is that the capacity in the system is still not enough in terms of uh, you know, satisfying both the demand signal, uh, because uh, EB will probably hire well over 1,000 people this year, and that's going to continue. Uh, into the next probably 10 years at a steady clip. And, and, um, and, and as I said, the, uh, it, you know, so it's demand on both sides in terms of uh, workers and employer uh, to, to meet the, the needs. The American Shipbuilding Association actually talked about um, you know, the, the 350 ship Navy, which came out of the Obama Secretary of Navy, uh, Secretary Mavis, but embraced by President Trump as well. We're looking at about 18 to 25,000 new workers and these are really skilled uh, uh, positions if we're going to meet the nation's uh, demand for this. And, um, and there really is no other sort of strategy other than well, we owe a, in terms of really trying to take on something that large. The other point I would just simply make in terms of the follow-up of the prior, um, and I'm going to ask a question, but 
If you look at the funding levels for 2017's omnibus that we just passed in April, it's still below what was in the authorized levels in WIOA. Again, the bipartisan WIOA, which authorized you know, higher uh, levels of funding than what was in the 2017 budget, and then that is the budget that Ms. Davis uh, you know, used as her baseline in terms of the cuts that were proposed in President Trump's budget, 40%. So we're, we're talking for about a level that is lower than what was authorized by a bipartisan bill, and we're already and we're cutting from that another uh, 40,000. So the capacity in the system in my district in terms of dealing with those 3,000 plus people who, who've uh, entered the portal and registered um, is going to be reduced uh, under this budget. And uh, and you know if there are efficiencies that we need to look at, you know in terms of overhead, let's do it. Uh, but the fact is is that uh, we're going to lose all the momentum that's happening all over the country uh, with these types of drastic cuts. And um, and again, I just. What you're seeing is, again, not just in eastern Connecticut, Mr. Painter, right? I mean, this is something that is aerospace, uh, you know, other uh, sectors that, that, um, that skills gap exists. Is that correct? Yes. We, I, I, you know, I don't visit a board. I don't hear from a board that, that says we have no issue around, around a skilled workforce. It's all over the place. Uh, a lot of conversation now around where the unemployment level is and what, what about the folks who are still out there outside of the, the labor market? What's the, what's the situation with the workforce? But you're right, Congressman, and, and I think it's where we fought hard for business-led boards at the state and local level because we firmly believe, as Mr. Dubin pointed out, that when business gets involved, we do look at things like effectiveness and we do look at efficiencies. When I first got into this business, uh, 1988 job training began to have performance standards. We're an accountability system. We have to perform in order to, to maintain local designation. We have to perform as, as states. So I think uh, what I hear universally from directors is that if, if WIOA did nothing else, it focused the workforce system on, to borrow a phrase, job one, and that is getting talent to business. And that's what we're about. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for yielding. I'll now recognize Mr. Smucker for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, uh, Mr. Berlin, thank you for being here. We appreciate you sharing your story. Uh, question for Ms. Pazinski and Mr. Dubin. My district is home to uh, numerous, numerous groups that serve individuals with disabilities, uh, including groups like Vision Corps, Unique Source, and Source America. And through recent conversations that I've had with uh, some of these groups regarding the in interpretation of WIO, I'm concerned that jobs for people with disabilities are being threatened by inconsistent implementation of portions of uh, WIOA. Uh, I understand that in recent weeks, 19 state vocational rehabilitation agencies have stopped making placements to nonprofit agencies for Ability One program jobs. And the guidance that they're referencing uh, is a Department of Education uh, FAC entitled um, integrated location criteria, the definition of competitive integrated employment. Uh, now in my district, these jobs are located in integrated settings, pay well above minimum wage. Uh, in many communities, Ability One jobs are among the best jobs available, especially important given the fact that 80% of people with disabilities don't have jobs at all. Uh, these jobs take place on military installations, at GSA buildings, and at many federal agencies where daily interaction with the general public and other government employees is a daily occurrence. And in fact, in addition, these jobs pay an average hourly weight of, rate of 1327. Uh, State VR agencies have been making placements to Ability One jobs through nonprofits for many years. So not only have thousands of individuals with disabilities found meaningful employment, but they'd have also reduced their reliance on public assistance programs while becoming proud taxpayers. So my question is, are your states still making VR referrals? Uh, if not, why? What are both, what are, what are you doing in South Carolina and Maryland to protect access to jobs for your constituents uh, with disabilities? Right, Ms. Pasinski. Yes, thank you, Representative Schmucker. In South Carolina, we are partnering very closely with our vocational rehabilitation a partner. Uh, they are involved with us from uh, creating strategies to align priority populations with the job openings. 
They are with us hand and foot, um, uh, elbow to elbow, as we talk about better business engagement. They are with us as we move forward and we're putting forth apprenticeships for priority populations. They are there with us, helping with some of those referrals so that the individuals are getting the same access to those apprenticeship opportunities that we know are so successful for work-based learning opportunities. And thank you, Mr. Duba. What's your experience um, in this area? Good example. Uh, last month, we actually had a neurodiversity, uh, 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 I guess, seminar at Towson State University um, on the autism spectrum and the unique challenges. I was I was uh, uh, graced with being able to attend that. I learned an awful lot, and I also learned that some of these barriers really aren't disabilities, they're unique abilities and other things. And the autism spectrum is one of those where there's a lot of Maryland companies, especially on the IT side and cyber side, that with that spectrum, there's some unique skill sets. So it was really interesting, and I would encourage other states to have some of these uh, uh, types of uh, 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 meetings uh, to educate people on the unique needs and abilities of what you're describing. Yeah. Thank you, and I'm going to change the subject. I don't have much time, but really interested in hearing what your states are doing in apprenticeship programs. Um, I come from a construction uh, contracting background, so we've uh, made use of apprenticeships, but also been looking at what other countries are doing in other states. I think bringing business to the table is such a fundamental part of making that successful, so I'd be just interested in hearing ways that you have worked to you both have talked about effective apprenticeship programs in your states. How have you gotten the businesses engaged? Uh, for us, uh, the construction industry is one of our uh, top sectors. And it was the construction industry that came to us and said, we would be willing and would like to have apprentices. And from the returning citizen population, we can really make this work. If it were not for construction leading that way, um, business representatives informing us of that opportunity, I don't know that we would have made the progress that we have seen today. Thank you. Mr. Dubin, 10 seconds. Uh, associated ABC in Maryland, yes. uh, Bu Builders and Contractors, and the NSA. Yes. Um, those are two big partners of ours on uh, apprenticeships. And yes, the NSA does have apprenticeships for high school students. Thank you. Through. Thank you. Good timing, Mr. Smucker. I uh, now recognize Mr. Ticano for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Painter, uh, the administration, uh, we've, we, we've touched upon these 40% cuts by the administration, proposed cuts. Uh, the, the administration also discussed how uh, having states take a large role in uh, federal programming, including WIOA, uh, could maybe compensate for this. Um, and we all know that state budgets are incredibly strained. Would the states uh, even be able to make this sort of financial adjustment, in your opinion? Thank you, Representative Takano. Um, I'm not a scholar of the of the state budgets, but there are are not that many states. In fact, it would be a minority of states that are putting putting funding into workforce development. A number of states have customized job training programs, which blend with uh, we owe a funding when when uh, on economic development projects. Great, thanks. Um, I want to follow up on the apprenticeship theme. Um, the media has reported that the administration will unveil a new apprenticeship program that will allow federal dollars to flow essentially to unregistered apprenticeship programs. This concerns me. The registration process provides a national standard for apprenticeship uh, programs and, for instance, established labor standards such uh, like, like wage scale and anti-discrimination provisions. And, and I'm, I'm concerned that this administration will undercut a tried and proven model. Uh, now, Ms. Pazinski, um, uh, South Carolina has become a model for expanding pr apprenticeships, going from 90 programs uh, in 2007 to nearly 900 programs. Congratulations on that. Um, uh, uh, in industries that range from advanced manufacturing to healthcare to information technology. And what's impressive is that these are all registered programs. Can you comment on why South Carolina has used the registration process to support program quality and why participating employers are willing to register their programs in your state? For our business community, registered apprenticeships offers a, a solution to the skill gap. And certainly in our state, we've incentivized apprenticeships to further foster the use of that as a tool. 
Uh, we, we believe firmly that uh, the willingness of business and industry to bring in the emerging workforce when coupled with an apprenticeship makes it an ideal learning situation for both the business and the youth. So we've seen great success because of our willingness to engage businesses, and it is a, a matter, though, of removing some of the red tape that does come with the process. So you've, I, I want to know more about that at some, maybe offline, but, um, but re having business, businesses have not found registering the apprenticeships to be overly burdensome. It doesn't seem like, because all of the, uh, what, from what I have here, all of the uh, apprenticeships are registered in South Carolina. So it doesn't seem like it's necessary necessarily for administration to say that, the, that this money that he's proposing should flow to unregistered programs. Well, in South Carolina, registered apprenticeships is actually coupled with our state technical college system. So it becomes an, ed an educational tool that's used for businesses predominantly, especially with our, our, our new businesses and our growing businesses. This is very interesting to me. Um, uh, so if South Carolina runs their apprenticeship uh, Carol, Apprenticeship Carolina model through state community colleges, and all of your 16 community colleges are engaged in the development and implementation of these programs. Now, can you tell us why that partnership with community colleges and other stakeholders is so important to the success of your approach? Certainly, it's, it has to do with the educational piece and the skills that comes from um, understanding what the business needs are and creating that apprenticeship to meet those needs. Now, could you have achieved the results you're getting without the support and services from these public sector partners, such as the community colleges? I think they've been absolutely instrumental in the success, yes. Well, thank you for that. I, you know, uh, d Mr. Painter, do you have anything to add to this? Um, I, with regard to the registration, what we're finding is I'd, I'd point to the West Michigan Workforce Board, which working in medical technicians actually working with employers help develop and file, and they are the sponsor of the registered apprenticeship. So it, it is a process that um, you know, requires some, some skill, but I think it's the registered apprenticeship also helps us in terms of the individual having the credentials that are recognized more broadly across the industry. So it's about recognizable credentials. So what may seem like red tape to some folks, I mean, it looks like South Carolina has been able to overcome uh, some of that burden and, and all of their 900 uh, 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 apprenticeships are, are registered apprenticeships. I, I'm impressed with that. Um, I just question uh, the, what the administration is doing in terms of allowing, I, I applaud that he wants to have money go to uh, apprenticeships, but uh, I question about uh, whether he should allow that to flow to unregistered apprenticeships. Thank you. Thank you, I thank gentlemen for yielding. I now recognize Mr. Allen for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you uh, all for participating today uh, in this important uh, hearing. Uh, a couple of things that, uh, that I've observed talking to the business community in my district in Georgia. Uh, well, first is uh, work, workforce participation. Um, you know, the, I understand the employment numbers, um, and of course, Georgia in, is, is, competes with South Carolina <laughs> regularly for these businesses, but both states are enjoying a, a low uh, number of, uh, uh, low employment number, but uh, I was interested in South Carolina, what is your, as far as workforce participation number? Those folks, and these are people that maybe have dropped out of high school, that um, uh, are either folks who have dropped out of the workforce who are not seeking employment and are able bodied. Do you have any idea what that number is in South Carolina as far as the, the, the workforce participation rate? I do not have that figure with me, but we can get that to you afterwards. Okay, I'd be interested to know are, are you targeting, uh, you know, is there a way to target those folks to get them interested in? in not only completing, say, they, their high school uh, diploma, but also getting into career education and, and uh, uh, some type of C, uh, CTE program? In, in South Carolina, certainly, you know, we, we recognize very much our, our partnership with adult education. And of course, they are in the communities, and that essentially is our outreach to those that have 
um, some may have disappeared for a bit, is going into the communities and engaging them there and then bringing them further into the services that are available. Well, we know that uh, uh, over in AG, the other committee I serve on, that we have about 45 million people, say, participating in SNAP program. And uh, certainly a percentage of these folks, uh, are, you know, if given the opportunity for proper training, and we've had folks like that testify there, that if given the opportunity for proper skill training and then the opportunity for a job, they move off of most of these, uh, these programs. And we got about 25 million people we need to get that, we need to get that done. So that's why I'm interested in that. As far as the uh, graduation rates, um, I called all of our county superintendents uh, right at the end of the school year. I have uh, 18 counties in the district. And just checking, uh, talking about graduation rates. I have one rural county that has a 94% graduation rate. And I said, how do you do this? He said, career track at a very young age. Uh, we take young people into the businesses. They see that, hey, I can do this, and they get on a track, and it's been very successful. Uh, Mr. Durbin, uh, from from your standpoint in Maryland, uh, are y'all are y'all are, are you looking at your high school dropout rate and why it's uh, if it's you know where it is and and how you can take these young people that we lose and get them involved in the workforce and get them involved in a career that, uh, that they'd be very happy to participate in. I can't give you the exact numbers and statistics, but I can give you something empirical quickly. Um, a young lady from Frederick, Maryland recently came in and, and uh, told her story to our board. Uh, she was going to drop out of high school. Uh, she really wasn't gonna go on the college track, but she loved working in the lab. And long story short, we had a CTE program that really took advantage of her skill sets in the lab. Uh, she ended up going through CTE, which was part of a community college. I think it was Frederick Community College program as well. And uh, within, when she graduated, she was making around $15 an hour. When she got her certifications and the rest of her uh, 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 credentialing, uh, she was making over $20 an hour at 20 or 21 years old and on her way to buying a house. So those are good stories. This was a young lady that came in very tearfully, sort of not testifying, but we did these presentations at each of our board meetings and told that story. So I don't have the exact statistics, but those are the kind of impacts we're having. How, how did she know about the, this program? Uh, um, it was a very in-demand program. We have limited resources in CTE in Maryland. That's a whole other issue. Um, but it was very in demand, and she was thinking of dropping out, and I think her guidance counselor uh, okay. told her about it. Okay, so your uh, high school uh, counselors know about your, the programs you offer there? Oh, yes, sir. Okay, all right, so that's a good source. Uh, that's great. Uh, as far as, um, uh, you know, Mr. Berlin, the new law is emphasizing the importance of providing a wraparound Ladies service. Ladies time is oh, expired. <laughs> No problem. Hey, I now recognize Ms. Blunt Rochester for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to thank the, the panel and uh, also congratulate Mr. Berlin on, on your success. Uh, I, uh, like my colleague, Mr. Mitchell, have been around for a while through CT, JTPA, CETA, WIN, Manpower. I was uh, Secretary of Labor when the Workforce Investment Act was initially signed and then worked for University of Massachusetts Boston at the Institute for Community Inclusion when WIOA was, was signed. And I can say, like many of you, there has been, an I would say, a tremendous progression. Uh, when I think of the concepts of uh, dual customer and the fact that we have to focus on both the employer and the job seeker, when I think about demand-driven, that we're really focused on what, what does the, the business community need using labor market information and also looking at evidence-based practices. There is a lot going on across the country. And uh, uh, I, I would say instead of less money, I, I'm not gonna say we need more in this environment, but I would say when the unemployment rate is low, it's when you get to people who are maybe harder to employ, whether it's prison to work or whether it's welfare to work or whether it's, it requires intensity. And so I, I would really like to focus on people with disabilities and get, get some feedback from you uh, 
Currently, there are 56 million people with disabilities across our country, and yet only about 29.2% are employed. And historically, our systems haven't done a good job of, of employing people with disabilities. And, and, and what, what WIOA was so successful at was saying that there was a presumption of ability that people could work and should work and, and have the right to work. And so I was hoping you could share a little bit more about your stories of, um, and their experiences of employing people with disabilities and improving employment outcomes for people with disabilities. And I'll start with Mr. Painter. Thank you, Congresswoman. I have to admit that um, it's, it's not an area I'm, I'm steeped in, so I reached out to the Consortium for Citizens with Disabilities. Uh, we work a lot with respectability and ask uh, Philip and his crew, like, what was going on? And I was really pleasantly surprised to hear his statement that they wanted to draw my attention and yours to the success of youth with disabilities under WIOA. Fully 15.6% of WIOA youth program participants were youth with disabilities. That means that over 13,000 youth with disabilities had unprecedented access to skill training and job placement. Fully 65% of them with disabilities entered into employment, ultimately a savings of over $300,000 per beneficiary. So we are making, I think, substantial progress. Uh, any of the other panelists have experiences and, and outcomes with people with disabilities? Yes, uh, Representative Rochester, in, so in South Carolina, I don't have outcomes, but we certainly have a lot of effort. And we have a coalition in our state that brings all the partners together that work with individuals with disabilities. And they engage the business community to find out what was the gap between um, individuals who had the skills and the hiring process. And from that, really started to come to the table with some strategies on how we could move forward. We have a, a, a marketing campaign that has moved forward. And we are expecting to see results from this. Uh, certainly, our State Workforce Development Board has identified that individuals with disabilities is, is a focus. And we've, we've brought it to the attention of the business community, and it's been well received. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Um, and I, if, Mr. Chairman, uh, if I could enter a letter into the record from the Council of State Administrators of Vocational Rehabilitation. Thank you. Uh, the other question that I had was um, also uh, we talked a little bit about uh, subminimum wage jobs. And so, Mr. Painter, can you provide examples of steps that states have taken to reduce subminimum wage jobs? I, I can provide, I can get that information to you. We'll certainly, we'll certainly look at it and, and talk to our members. Um, I would just close by sharing that uh, I will be getting information from the Institute for Community Inclusion on uh, projects that have been happening across the country in different places, very creative and innovative ways to help people who are on social security disability move into jobs. And I think as we talk about the future, we need to be looking at how we can continue the positive progression that WIOA has, has begun. Thank you, I yield back. Thank you for yielding. I now recognize Mr. Byrne for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm the former chancellor of post-secondary education in the state of Alabama. That's our community college system. Former chair of a state workforce planning council, member of the state uh, workforce board, and we staff the, the state workforce board. So I'm really pleased to hear all the progress we're hearing around the country. We passed WIOA my first year in Congress. So most of the hard work on it was already done before I got here. But I was really pleased to support it because it was in line with a lot of the things that I had learned, the lessons I had learned from my positions. And what we were really focused on was to try to get more private sector leadership and try to respond to the needs of employers. So that was our intent. Sometimes we don't always hit the mark. And so what I'd like to know, particularly from you, Mr. Painter, and you, Mr. Dubin, how we do. Can we do better with the law than we did with uh, WIOA? Uh, Congressman, thanks, thanks for the question. I think if there is anything that makes me uh, more happy, or I don't, I don't know what it is as I travel the country, but to see the kind of business engagement that we have. For example, in Benton Harbor, Michigan, Whirlpool has trained three of the staff for our workforce board there, Conexus, in Six Sigma. 
They were the highest in their class. They are now working to look at how we do these things of increasing the effectiveness and the efficiency in, inside the system. Um, when you look at the training programs, when you look at, we just recently honored Lockheed Martin in the aviation uh, consortium around the, the Tarrant County and the Dallas area because of the involvement. Business worked hand in glove with the workforce boards not only to help identify what impact the aviation industry has in the Dallas region, but to develop a very unique video or a game that you can play on your smartphone called Flyby DFW, which engages, was designed by young people, built by young people with the workforce board and with business, and now engages lots of, lots of young people in learning more about the aviation industry. I think there are examples across the country like that. Um, Congressman Thompson is very involved with career and technical education. We honored uh, Wyoming Machines, which is in Minnesota. Two sisters started a company. They are very involved with not only the community college system, but the workforce board and, and events like women in technology and reaching back. So it is, it is happening. And the question is, can we do better? Without question, I, I think that's you designed, and I take very seriously continuous improvement as part of one of the core tenets of, of WIOA and as National Association of Workforce Boards, that's we constantly talk about work to the workforce boards about we can do better. And that I think that's where business engagement likewise helps us understand how. Thank you, Mr. Dubin. You know, my observations are, uh, are really, uh, I guess, twofold. One, uh, we've made it on our, on our state board, uh, you know, an important, it, it, it's important to do service. So uh, in the business community or in the ecosystem of workforce, we've made it to be, you know, something that's very, very important in terms of public service. A lot of us serve on the boards of our churches and community groups and nonprofits. This is very, very, very important. So we've made that a focus. And uh, we put the arm on businesses in our communities. So we've been selecting well. We've been trying to get that big web you know, out there. But I think it comes down to people uh, uh, being willing to give up their time and energy as a volunteer. I'm, I'm a volunteer. Um, you know, I have a day job, and this is something that I, that's become a passion because it's a great way to serve. And that's part of the message I think we need to get out. This is a great way to serve, and it's, and it's productive. Because if you're smart about it, you're also finding populations and groups of people that you can employ. And I think it's a really good thing. So we're, I think service is getting that, 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 that message across. Well, I, I just wanted to close my time by saying this. Um, I hear a lot of talk about money, and money's important. Golly, I know that, having, having run these programs. But sometimes the most uh, impact that we have comes when we bring in people from the private sector. And the people from the private sector do things that governments simply can't do. I wasn't very good at persuading a 15-year-old to be interested in career technical education. But if I brought in the local employer that would actually employ that 15-year-old when he or she finished that program, we got their attention. And we got their mother and dad's attention as well. So. I really want to commend your work and the work that we hope that we've begun under WIOA to get more private sector people involved because that's where the rubber's really going to hit the road. And I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Mr. Polis is recognized for five minutes for questions. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chairman Guthrie and uh, Ranking Member Davis. And uh, this is a very important topic. When WIOA passed in 2014, uh, it really made important changes to better align our workforce development system with the skills that people need to succeed in the 21st century. I'm proud that our Colorado State Plan really uh, seeks to do just that. The plan focuses on engaging the business community and industry to align the workforce training programs, as well as leveraging data to support strong accountability and innovation. Uh, we recently launched CareerWise, a program that aligns our educational workforce systems through a new public-private partnership I'm very excited about uh, with the state and industry leaders. CareerWise has a goal of placing 20,000 high school students in apprenticeships by 2027, uh, which would give students real-world on-the-job experience, put them on a path towards a good-paying career. 
Uh, Mr. Uh, Painter, in your testimony, you mentioned support from WIOA grants for coding programs in Eastern Kentucky. In our state, there's several coding boot camps like Galvanize and the Turing School, which graduate students and help place them into good paying jobs just waiting to be filled. But because these programs don't have higher education accreditation, they're not eligible for federal education aid. They're largely self-paid. Uh, but some are exploring potentials for receiving state workforce grants, another potential uh, avenue uh, to help lower income families be able to avail themselves of those opportunities. Can you speak more about short-term accelerated programs like coding boot camps and what states can do to ensure quality, accountability, but also accessibility uh, for the programs to receive funding? Uh, thank you, Congressman. And uh, Colorado is one of my favorite workforce systems to, to visit. You have a, a collaborative uh, DNA, I think, uh, in, or a gene in your in your DNA in Colorado. Um, right. What we are seeing are these kind of short-term boot camps, and they're not they're across industries. You can look at examples in Minnesota where the workforce board put together with the healthcare sector a boot camp that has been able to reduce turnover. So that's real money to business. When individuals know Did the that workforce in center originate that or were they just kind of a partner in the conversations? They were they were a partner with yeah. business. Business came to them and said, "How do we reduce turnover in some of our mm -hmm. entry level positions?" So they designed a boot camp so the individual really does understand what the work is. There are examples in in manufacturing where workforce boards have designed boot camps around manufacturing. Um, the robotics competition was mentioned earlier. It's an incredible program. Are there any barriers to WIOA participation that we should be aware of or, or act to remove? I think when when the funding is solely solely based on on WIOA, um, you know, we talked earlier about cuts. When we're picking up the bill for these boot camps and we can't find the funds to braid, then they are certainly at risk. Uh, another question, uh, Mr. Mr. Painter, and we'll go to anybody else who wants to address it. As you know, um, entrepreneurship is absolutely critical for our future success. Today's garage company could be tomorrow's uh, employer of thousands of people. And recent research from the Coffin Foundation found that about 20% of gross job creation comes from brand new businesses. Um, can you talk about how uh, WIOA supports entrepreneurship? And is there more that Congress can do to support opportunities in entrepreneurship from self-employment to uh, creating uh, tomorrow's great company? We've come a long way in workforce boards supporting entrepreneurial training. One of the most uh, gratifying projects is if you look at Gainesville, Florida, uh, the Innovation Center at the University of Florida, the workforce board works hand in glove with them so that companies that need the next employee can find on the job training contracts through the board. Incumbent worker training is provided to entrepreneurs and startups to move those companies. So when you look at the, the wall of companies that have graduated, if you will, from the Innovation Center, it is replete with companies that have received WIOA support. Would somebody else like to address the uh, entrepreneurship within WIOA and how we can further encourage that? No. Finally, Mr. Painter, um, a critical component of supporting Colorado's WIO implementation is funding, of course, and as you mentioned, President Trump's proposed budget makes drastic cuts. Can you share uh, more about what the effect of those budget cuts would be if they were to occur, and what would be the trickle-down effect to local workforce boards where the rubber beats the road? Um, local workforce boards are, are going to experience, um, you know, there's a certain amount of infrastructure, there is a certain amount of fixed cost that's in the system because we must maintain one stops in every local area across the, across the country. Um, it's going to have an impact on, we look at 5,000 youth, uh, you know, an average cost in, uh, of $5,000 per, per youth served. I talked to a board recently that has 34,000 young people, 16 to 24, not in the labor force. They have money to serve 1,000. Yeah. Budget cuts are going to impact even that. We, we can't even serve the number of individuals now who are eligible. Thank you, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back, recognizes Mr. Grothman for five minutes for questions. Thank you very much. I think I'll aim these at Mrs. Bozinski, but anybody else who wants to talk, you can feel free to chime in. Um, I've always been very interested in people with different abilities. Uh, yesterday, stopping by my office, a gal who I've known before, uh, she's 35 years old, uh, working at Walmart, uh, you know, taking care of herself, and just a, just a tremendous story, and a story I wish I could repeat it again and again and again. It, it seems to me 
that um, th this program doesn't necessarily always offer the flexibility we'd want for people in her position. Um, it's my understanding the Rehabilitation Services Administration has advised state vo vocational rehab offices not to refer people with disabilities to jobs falling under Ability One contracts or state set aside programs. Is that possibly true? In South Carolina, vocational rehabilitation is braided within the workforce system. We are true partners in finding okay. people employment. If a person learns of any available job, are the states being prohibited from providing any necessary supports? And I'd like any of the rest of you to answer too if that applies to your state. We are, uh, again, we are moving forward in a partnership and for individuals going through the voca vocational rehabilitation system. Okay, I'll ask you something more specific. Under Section 511 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, which is amended through, through this law, it bars anyone with a disability under the age of 25 to work under uh, Section, 14C, uh, Section 14C certificate for less than minimum wage unless they have failed one or more jobs. Is that, do you believe that's true? I, I do not have information on that. Okay. Okay, I, I will emphasize to you, and I want you to get back to the committee. Um, I, I sometimes feel we are not doing enough to provide flexibility for people with different uh, types of disabilities as they transition into being self-supporting in life and would like your input uh, to the committee in that regard. And I'll give you a, a, a general broader question. Um, it is true that under President Trump's proposed budget, there's some cutbacks in these programs. But I'd like each of you in your states to tell me, percentage-wise, how much of these programs right now are state-funded as opposed to funded by your local businesses or state and local governments. I would have to get back to the committee with that information. Do you have an approximation? I do not have approximation. 60%, 15%? I would like to get back to the committee with okay. information. Any, any of the rest of you? Yes. Mr. I think Chairman. we're uh, about 90% federally funded. Okay. Mr. Painter, Mr. Berlin, in your areas? Um, I, the, it has to be the vast majority of the money is, is federal money. I mean, I know when we were looking at who's paying the cost for the American Job Centers that uh, was Wagner Pizer and uh, and then WIA the adult dislocated worker and youth projects that were paying well over uh, ninety percent. Okay, Mr. Berlin. Um, so I was a candidate in in. The you really wouldn't be able to. So I wouldn't have that. Let us know. Okay. Do you feel that there are any um, federal requirements here? And I'll ask any of you that we could lift, that would give you more flexibility, that would make things better? In other words, are, are there ever, as you administer these programs or deal with these programs, situations you say, oh, geez, why do we have to fill out this form, or why can't we do that? Um, I, I believe that there's really a lot of uh, prohibitions around marketing. I mean, one of the basic things I asked is why aren't we you know, getting the message out a little bit more commercially, like we're used to. And I'd have to get back to you on the specifics, but I face some real barriers in tapping dollars to do something that any of us in business would do. That's market ourselves in a commercial way. So why don't I get, I'll, I'll get back to you with recommendations there that are more specific. Okay. Ms. Pazinski, do you have any, as you deal with these programs where you kind of feel like, oh, why, either why do I have to fill out this form or why can't I do this? I would say that when it comes to reporting effectiveness and serving businesses, each state would have its own performance measure indicators based upon what their businesses are indicating what success looks like. Okay, so you don't feel in any way your hands are tied by federal rules or regulations? We continue to move forward with the implementation, and so uh, at this time I do not have anything to offer. Okay. I'll yield the remainder of my time. Gentlemen, time has expired, and I now recognize Mr. Desaunier for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I really appreciate the work that all of you do, and 
um, Mr. Berlin, the experience you've had. So my questions um, kind of come from a viewpoint that having been involved in a workforce investment board as a small business owner, um, and then been involved at the state of California as an elected official, I carried a bill uh, that both had the Chamber of Commerce and the Labor Federation as their sponsors, and I thought I had find, found nirvana. And the, the bill just required, that tw and this was during the recession, so there was a real sense of urgency um, around the country, and it was true for California as well, about getting people to work in, a, in an environment that no one had seen before in terms of how do we get people to work. So the bill just said that 25% of all your funds has to go to training. Um, some of our boards thought I was the antichrist for presenting this, and I don't want to sound like, well, the, Ms. Fox has accused me when I bring this up of sounding like a Republican, so Mr. Chairman and ranking member accept this. So I've seen really high-performing workforce investment boards, and I've seen some that aren't so high-performing. So we are loath to prescribe too much, but Mr. Dubin and then Mr. Painter, how do we get the level of, I think, urgency that our clients need, both the employers and the employees, that you seem to have struck, Mr. Dubin, in, in Maryland, to get those high-performing boards to bring the lower-performing boards up to the same level. And I see too many boards um, in California that are checking boxes, that don't have that level of urgency and, and want to do what you seem to have done um, in Maryland. So maybe you could address that. Well, first, in Maryland, I, I feel like I have a real mandate from uh, our governor. So if it starts there, if it starts at the top, um, you feel you know, pretty broad-shouldered in going and putting arms on people and asking them to come and participate. So I think it comes with, with leadership. We're also self-imposing our own benchmarking right now. We're going to be benchmarking and setting the bar higher than the federal standards. So on some of the concerns about the federal standards, I'm not an expert on all the paperwork and all the rest. But I will tell you that the standards and the ways that, the ways that we are, we'll be judging ourselves, the efficacy of service and delivery, is around human beings being employed and the stickiness of that employment. And we literally have a task force now that I'm participating on as well with, with our Department of uh, uh, Labor in the state of Maryland on, those, on that benchmarking. And I think we have an opportunity to sort of be one of the national leaders in that benchmarking. And perhaps that's a way. In, in teaching those benchmarks that are being thought through in 2017 to bring the standard and raise the bar for some of the less performing uh, boards. So you found that to be effective just by having those performance standards. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sure there are boards that perform better than others in your state, and you're seeing all of the levels come up by doing that. We're, we, we, we anticipate that will happen. That's why we're doing sort of our state higher bar than we owe a uh, benchmarking and standards. Mr. Painter? Uh, thanks for the question, Congressman. It certainly, um, it certainly concerns us as well that we want high-performing workforce boards across the U.S. I think one of the things that, um, you know, one of the victims when budget gets tight is that you start letting go of, of internal training. And I think when we look at a labor market that has as many transactions in the course of a year as the U.S. labor market, I think to a degree, collectively, we have been remiss in not investing more money in the thousands of people who offer uh, assistance to people like Heath across the country. Uh, I would really like to see us spend more money on internal capacity building for workforce development professionals. I just, on a sort of, on a separate issue, but one of my colleagues from Michigan brought this up and I have a lot of respect for um, him about having unemployment rates be sort of the performance mark in whether we should lower budgets or in, but the, that's, that I think is just one thing we should consider. Mr. Painter, maybe you can re sort of respond to that, that we have people who are out of the workforce right now, we have people on disability, we've got people who need to be retrained. So their unemployment is not the only measurement we should be looking at in terms of reinvesting in, in, in in these issues? No, I, I would agree. I think uh, the situation we're in, I had the opportunity the other day to talk to an economist who was talking about the situation we're in, that this is really a skill development pathway that we have to pursue in order to get ourselves out of what, what we're hearing from employers in terms of not being able to find qualified workers. To find those individuals who are on the, the, the periphery of the labor market today takes marketing, takes more effort, takes the innovation that we're seeing out of some of the workforce boards with 
better websites, reliance on smartphone messaging to, to individuals. But, um, you know, again, I, I hate to sound like a broken record, but again, that takes resources to do that kind of change. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Gentleman uh, yields back. Mr. Barletta is recognized for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Dubin, thank you for being here, and uh, I appreciate you recognizing the SHINE program. Uh, I've long been a, a champion of SHINE from uh, the very first day that I toured uh, the, the program. And it's a, for those who don't know, it's an after-school program operating in my district that is geared towards students from kindergarten to uh, through eighth grade. The SHINE program has been proven uh, to help kids improve attendance, uh, behavior, test scores. Uh, teachers have, uh, have come forward and saw a remarkable difference in, in these students that, uh, that weren't showing up to school as much. Their attendance may not have been as good and they were not participating and all of that has changed because of that program. And, and, and Shine has showed me that when you awaken the minds of, of young children with hope and possibility of what their futures can be, that there's no stopping them. Uh, that's why I'm happy that you chose to highlight one of Shine's many strengths, connecting students with career and technical uh, experts so that they are exposed to job opportunities that they otherwise might not even know exist. Uh, we all know that we must bridge the skills gap to help more of our constituents realize good paying jobs and to help our local businesses thrive. This is good for our communities and it's good for America. But I believe we must also work to remove the stigma that's associated with non-traditional technical careers. Students show that educating, studies show that educating students about their options at a younger age is central to achieving this goal. After all, even if we have job training programs in place, uh, they are nothing without dedicated and enthusiastic, enthusiastic students uh, to take advantage of them. So Mr. Dubin, through your experiences on the Maryland Workforce Board, do you have any suggestions on how we can better incentivize workforce development organizations to engage with after-school programs like SHINE? And how can communities work within the existing framework of WIOA to establish and identify these partnerships? I think the first step is uh, with the educators. Um, you know, sometimes you get some of the resistance from the educators because they're teaching, you know, different sorts of skills. You know, educators have their own idea about pedagogy, their own idea about the experiences in school. And uh, I think that's where some of, the, some of the, the, the block may be, to be candid, is having that dialogue and uh, uh, having the, you know, will at the state level uh, to have those discussions with your state school superintendents or what have you. So I think that's a big one. In Maryland, we have very successful CTU programs. We just need to find avenues for more funding. I'll be very clear about it. I'm a big proponent of you know funding and where you get those dollars. There's usually big waiting lists. And uh, uh, so you know funding to CTE, the educators, um, a lot of employers that are looking for, uh, 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 for skilled people, people that need to be trained, um, in our state, they very much are partners at, with CTE. I think that, that we're under capacity in, in what we're producing in, in, on the CTE side, actually. Yeah. I, I, had a, I had a local employer approach me just a couple weeks ago and said he, he had 100 good paying jobs, but literally cannot find people to, uh, to fill them. In fact, his biggest hurdle, he said, was getting people to pass the drug test. And I hear this more and more often. Uh, and it's, it's uh, discouraging when there are so many people unemployed, there are so many jobs that are available, and, and we know what we gotta do, teach the skills, but I, but I think somewhere we gotta go back to teach basic skills, like showing up to work on time, and you know, don't call in sick five minutes before you're supposed to show up. And if I may, that's, that's one of the reasons um, the state of Maryland also, uh, spend some considerable resources on soft skills. Soft skills are important, especially, yeah. soft skills are very important. Um, uh, not everyone, you know, had the advantage of growing up with uh, uh, people around them that taught them the things you need to be successful. And so I, I'm a, also a big proponent of soft skills training, and uh, we see it at the board all the time, those big success stories, because that little extra element of soft skills gave someone the ability to go and do an interview and get a job. 
And I, I'm going to close with another commercial. If anyone hasn't heard about the SHINE program, go online because it can be a model around the country. We have taken kids who may have lost interest and totally redirected their life. These, when I went in, these kids were building robots and remote control cars. It was just, it was just amazing. And, and uh, I think we really got to refocus where we're, uh, who we're helping. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. I recognize uh, Mr. Espayat. Five minutes for questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record a letter from the Campaign for Youth, which underscores the importance of YIOA's federal investment in youth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Mr. Painter, as others have mentioned here uh, today, YIOA uh, prioritizes uh, services for those with the greatest barriers to employment, including uh, low-income and out-of-school youth. I know this firsthand because I benefited from uh, a summer youth job program in New York. In fact, it was my first job opportunity as a young, a young teenager and can attest to how critical funding uh, for these programs are. Uh, while YIOA focuses funding on out-of-school youth, the law still encourages services to low-income and in-school youth. This means that local workforce systems must engage and partner with school districts to serve these young people. What does that mean for areas, big urban areas like New York City that have a large school system and, a, and unfortunately a very high dropout rate? I think uh, as, as the Congressman Barletta mentioned, uh, workforce boards across the country, we're, uh, I'm very happy to say, are funded by, NAWB is funded by the Kellogg Foundation to pursue a two-generation strategy. When we got the award, we put out a notice to local boards uh, we, had, we gave them 10 days to respond back to us. 13 of them came back and asked us to help fund local efforts. So we're working in Montgomery County, Maryland, Maricopa, Arizona, and El Paso, Texas. What we discovered is that workforce boards, through their business partnerships, are involved with the PK through 12 system in all aspects, working at career days, working with career and tech centers on what kind of occupations are in demand, what are the certifications that industries in the region are, are looking at. I think with regard to, again, with regard to out-of-school youth, there are places like Cincinnati, Ohio, Hamilton County where virtually 100% of the youth money is spent on out-of-school youth. It is one of the major changes in, in WIOA, and I'm happy to say that, that I think we are making substantial progress in trying to figure out how to reach out-of-school youth and re-engage them, uh, many times through projects like robotics and hands-on kind of work-based learning. Um, in fiscal year 16, New York City alone received more than $65 million in, in total from y, um, IOA funding for employment programs serving two groups of New Yorkers, the youth and adults. Uh, New York City has utilized this funding to reconnect our disconnected youth to educational and workforce opportunities and has played an integral role in providing adults with the necessary skill sets to enter the workforce. For example, the Workforce of One Centers, one of which is located in Harlem, in my district, right, receive a YA, y, WYOA funding and connect 25,000 New Yorkers to, to jobs. Earlier this year, the Workforce One Healthcare Career Center, a specialized center with industry expertise in health care, worked closely with Center Plans for Healthy Living and the second largest managed long-term care provider in New York State. This employer was facing severe challenges finding the approximately appropriately qualified registered nurses, which seems to be uh, a great need, uh, not just in New York State, but across the country. But the healthcare center successfully saw, screened, and referred a number of qualified registered nurse, nurses to the employer. The result was a phenomenal uh, increase. 21 individuals got hired for over the course of the one month as registered nurses, earning between $74,000 and $86,000 per year, and the employer was thrilled to fill so many positions so quickly. Can you explain what are the real and lasting impacts of essentially uh, cutting in half our investment in these critical programs, specifically in New York. Well, I think as you as you mentioned, Congressman, I mean, in many places, 
WIOA is the foundation of these, these connections between out-of-school youth and in some cases in-school youth through the work of the boards. Um, there is nothing else. Uh, we owe it is the foundation of making these connections. In New York, as you mentioned again, it is one of the key partners that in, in the projects that are, that are going on in, in New York City as, as it is elsewhere. When you think about summer youth employment, uh, it is a braiding of funding at the local level between, as Mr. Dubin pointed out, business uh, kicking in, local philanthropic, CDBG, CSBG, uh, and, and we owe a funds, all braided to try and provide the work experience that we know is essential for young people to get to, to experience. And I'm happy to say, like you, I am a former uh, summer youth employment participant. Thanks. Gentlemen, thank time's expired. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Thank you. And I now recognize Mr. Thompson for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Chairman. Thanks, members of the panel, for, for being here today. Uh, I'm very proud of the work that uh, we've done over the past number of years here on this Workforce uh, Education and Workforce Committee, uh, starting with a um, strong bipartisan piece of legislation that we're doing oversight on today, WIOA. Um, and, Chairman, thank you for doing the oversight. I've found that it's not good enough to pass uh, effective and righteous pieces of legislation, but um, unfortunately we are at the mercies of unelected bureaucrats on how it gets implemented. And, and providing that oversight makes sure that things stay true to the intent of Congress. Uh, this WIOA was written with, you know, I'm sure there's a number of principles you could reflect on, but the whole uh, learn to earn and, um, and skills-based education principles. And those are principles we brought forward with the Every Student Succeeds Act. Uh, those will be, um, uh, which is being implemented now. And, and next week, I'm hopeful on the floor, we'll have the Career and Technical Education Bill, uh, which obviously was, was authored with those, following the, those same two principles. And sometime in the future, we'll, we'll do the Higher Education Act, which, quite frankly, those two principles work for the Higher Education Act as well. Learn to earn and skills-based education. Um, my first question is, how well, how, how looking, knowing the, the basic elements of WIOA that we really were, felt were so important, how well have we achieved at bringing business and industry, aka job creators, uh, into a majority level on our web boards? Uh, Congressman, I'll take that first. I, I think uh, I'm happy to, to observe you served on a very active board. That, I am a uh, recovering web board member. You are. Sure. The first time I ever heard of the term mechatronics as, a, as yeah. an industry, I heard from your workforce board as you worked with closely with business. That's what we're seeing across the country, that there are initiatives at community colleges, there are initiatives elsewhere that have been brought about because of the Workforce Board's role in convening businesses, in working with sector partnerships in their local area that have brought to the attention of the whole workforce development system the need to sometimes change curriculum, focus more on a particular certification yeah. than they have in so, the past. So I think we're making progress. Good, So, but the, the essential question, the, the, the basic point, the starting point is, are we at 100% compliance with all of our web boards having a majority stakeholder entrance and interest being job creators today. Uh, that was an essential element of WIOA. Let me say many times people don't call me to tell me wonderful success stories. Okay. They, they call me to tell me whether it's a state director or local, there's a problem. Well, I'm welcome, not aware that we have to compliance our problems. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not aware we have those those compliance. I, I'm not aware of boards okay. that are not. No, I, I just it was interested because my assumption is we've, we're, we're in compliance. We're moving ahead with implementation. So, um, you know, at one time when I was on a workforce board, it was there was a bit of a conflict of interest. It was the training and education facilities that had the stronger representation. Not that they're not great people, they're great partners, uh, but our vision with, was WIOA, was the people who knew what the jobs were going to be today and tomorrow were the ones we want uh, governing our workforce investment boards. So assuming that we're, we're in compliance, have, have, we, have we seen better employment success as a result of implementation of, of in-demand skills-based education? 
I'm, I'm going to say the, uh, I can provide you uh, examples, but I'm going to say yes, yes, we have. We have seen uh, the example that I cited in Pittsburgh, 100 percent placement. Great. Uh, it was not too long ago I was in West Virginia where the Workforce Board and the Community College put together some basic training for advanced manufacturing. Placement rate was 100 percent. So I, I think we are seeing a, uh, the industry move to a very targeted approach. That's great. That's better than my experience under the old rules where we were training some arbitrary list at the state capitol that had nothing to do with uh, the economic job opportunities in our, in our region. Um, that's why we appreciated, Congressman, local, local control and local go. direction for the programming. Absolutely. Uh, very quickly, I um, uh, was interested in to see uh, uh, follow up on the gentlelady from Delaware. Uh, we owe, which obviously I'm a big fan of, but you know, you, you don't get everything quite right. And I'm, I do have some concerns. Have you seen any impacts on individuals with significant physical and intellectual needs? Because I've been, I, I'm a big, I, I love being, I, at one time, and unfortunately, a lot of that has gone away, being in sheltered workshops on payday. Now, I've worked with people facing life-changing disease and disability for 28 years. So I'm committed to lifting people, empowering people, moving people to, you know, uh, uh, good gainful employment. Uh, but some folks have such complex disabilities that they just don't reach that level. And, um, and there was nothing more... Uh, it was a celebration on payday when those checks were handed out, even though they were a couple dollars, maybe. And I'm, I'm finding that there's uh, one of the impacts that we owe, perhaps, I'm not quite sure, is that the opportunities for people who just have such significant physical and intellectual disabilities, they can't get to that, that uh, um, minimum wage plus employment. And so I've run out of time, but if you've got any insight into... Uh, the impacts in your areas, your states, on on um, those individuals. I'd, I'd love to get that in writing. Thanks. The gentleman time has expired. I recognize Ms. Bonamici for five minutes for questions. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member, and thank you for allowing me to join uh, these two subcommittees. Even though uh, I don't serve on the subcommittees, this is such an important issue, and uh, I look at it uh, also from my K-12 uh, committee experience and background. Uh, there are so many overlapping issues, I think, as we've seen from the discussion today. Uh, we all hear about the skills gap when we're back at home, and, and this has been true regardless of how unemployment is. Uh, of course, there are different challenges, as my colleague from Delaware pointed out, when there is low unemployment, the, 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 the need is in, in different, um, maybe more intense, because there are people like uh, people with disabilities or the long-term unemployed and, and, and still have significant, significant challenges. One of the things I wanted to note is that the, the level of expertise, and I appreciate all of your, your expertise as people who work in the field, and Mr. Berlin, your success story, thank you for sharing that. The, the level of expertise on this committee, I think, is really impressive of people who have real-world experience. Um, I'm someone who, who hears about the skills gap and is working hard to address it um, in a couple ways. And we talked about the, the CTE legislation, which uh, I'm very excited about. I hope this time we can get it uh, uh, through the Senate as well as through the House. Um, Mr. Dubin, you spoke in your testimony about work study. I'm working with Mr. Byrne on a bipartisan proposal uh, to, to help with work study funding, but also to help align work study jobs with the students' uh, career interests uh, and, and career path um, after school programs, which we, we've it was noted in, in testimony how important after-school programs are. I'm extremely concerned about the proposed cuts to, for example, 21st century learning. Uh, we need to make sure that all of those programs are there so that we, we minimize the, the, the need to fix the skills gap, that we have more, more people ready for the workforce, soft skills was, was addressed. Um, the, the funding challenges are significant, and, and I would like to introduce Mr. Chairman into the record a letter from the Campaign to Invest in America's workforce. This is addressed to the House and Senate Appropriations Committees in support of funding workforce programs. These are such a good investment, so with, uh, I would like to introduce that to the record. Thank you. Uh, like Representative Courtney and Chairwoman Fox, many of us, I was at the bill signing for, the, for uh, WIOA. It was my first bill signing as a member of Congress. It was pretty exciting. It was so bipartisan. Uh, and, and I was very proud of that bill and 
now we're seeing uh, seeing it being implemented. One of the things that I appreciated, and you know, listening to a lot of the hearings when we were working on it, uh, is is the coordination and the emphasis on coordination uh, between employers, federal agencies, workforce training programs, educational systems, nonprofits. Uh, and I know, Mr. Dubin, you talked about collaboration that's happening in your state. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk about in, in my district in, in Northwest Oregon, Easter Seals facilitates the Washington County Senior Community Service Employment Program, which is an Older Americans Act program, but they work together, and I also oppose the budget cuts to, the, well, actually, the budget that seeks to completely eliminate this program. Uh, Easter Seals co-locates the Senior Community Service Employment Program in Oregon's work source centers. Uh, which is part of America's Job Center Network. So as a result of this co-location, the participants get the sort of optimal access to the training, resources, and opportunities they need to develop new skills and re-enter the workforce. And I tell you, there is age discrimination out there. Uh, older Americans have a, a much uh, more challenging time. So Mr. Painter, can you <clears throat> excuse me, discuss a little bit the benefits of coordinated co-location and, and how these, these types of programs have, have uh, benefited from this integration. Thank you, Congresswoman. <clears throat> in, a, in a previous life as a, as a local director, I got to administer uh, senior community service employment. So firsthand, we got to see the impact that, that it has in providing mm -hmm. older Americans with an opportunity to re-enter the, the, the workforce, to acquire different sets of skills. You're right, the coordination is, is critical. It's critical that we have a, an approach to business that it's a strategic approach to business, that it's not necessarily pitting one group another, but it's looking at the business strategy and then coming back and as a collective team, which is happening more and more, how can we solve this problem? And what, what talent resources do we collectively have? And then working as, as Heath's uh, example, using on-the-job training, using internships, uh, platform to employment out of Connecticut is a remarkable example of how you can take work uh, on-the-job training, internships, work experience, and, and craft that. But it takes that, um, that coordination among the, the providers. Terrific. And as I yield back, I just want to align myself with Mr. Takano's concerns uh, about the possibility of eliminating uh, re the registration process for apprenticeships. Uh, I, I would be more than interested in hearing examples of how the registration process for internships, for uh, apprenticeships, if it's not working well, if we need to streamline it or fix it, I'd be very concerned about eliminating it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. I thank the gentlelady for yielding back, and I would, that concludes uh, members' questions. I would like to thank our witnesses for taking the time to testify before our subcommittee today. And before I recognize uh, ranking member for any closing comments, I just want to say what she said in the beginning. We have, uh, when we send letters to each other here, we call them dear colleagues. But we actually have a dear colleague that is um, recovering, and we have four other people who serve this house and therefore serve this country that are recovering today. But we also, as the day went on yesterday, talked to so many other of our dear colleagues who were part of a traumatic experience. Uh, one that was, I guess the guy started outside of third base shooting go in, and he was in left field right next to him, but the guy shot into the infield. And so we have a lot of people that are going through that. So be mindful as we got through the day that uh, we have a lot of people hurting and uh, we've had a lot of prayers answered as well. So I recognize um, my ranking member Davis for any closing comments. Thank you, Chairman. Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate um, those comments as well. Wanted to thank you all so much. Uh, I think it's been a very thoughtful discussion. We uh, really appreciate your experiences and your expertise as well. And I just wanted to mention so quickly because I think we have a sense of the breadth and the depth of so many you know, fabulous examples throughout our country where people are really centered on trying to find the very, very best way to help both employees and employers and, and make the marketplace one that works for everyone. And one of the issues that we, we've touched on a little bit but not, not uh, fully uh, is that one of apprenticeships. And I think that what we now have uh, a proposal out there is to be, again, very thoughtful as how we approach that. It, you know, it's always in the details that it's very, very important, and we want to be sure that we don't cut off opportunities in some areas in order to do something different um, that, in, in many cases, may not have the same kind of accountability. We're talking about 
American taxpayer dollars, and we want to be sure that those taxpayer dollars go to those programs that we have the ability to really be able to understand whether they are helpful or not, whether they're doing what we say they're going to do. So you've touched on, on some of that. We're certainly going to be having far more discussions in the future, Mr. Chairman, and I thank you all very much for being here. Thank you very much, and you've been very informative and really appreciate your testimony. And without objection, there being no further business, the subcommittee stands adjourned.